Thank you, Brenda. Well, let's, um, let's have our Bible open uh, at that passage and let's ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, your word is balm for the broken, ballast for the bewildered, and bread for the hungry. And so, Father, please come to us this morning through your word to comfort us, to reassure us, and to feed us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) Well, Nigel was a student at Cambridge University at the same time as Prince Charles. And uh, while he was there, uh, a mission was organised to reach the various university students with the gospel. Uh, In those days, the Cambridge Christian Union was fairly small, and uh, all of the members of the Christian Union were asked to go and knock on the doors of all the various students in the colleges and invite them to one of the gospel talks. And uh, Nigel was asked to go and knock on the door of Prince Charles. Now, unsurprisingly, he was rather nervous about that. Uh, His Christian friends were praying eagerly and earnestly and waiting anxiously to hear what happened. So he he went, he knocked on the door, uh, a bodyguard answered the door and let him in. And Charles was apparently extremely gracious and they chatted for quite a long time. But at the end of the conversation, Prince Charles said that he thought Christianity was useful, but uh, not really for him. That was the end of the conversation. And very sadly, Prince Charles wasn't going to go and listen to a gospel talk. Well, Nigel, of course, left feeling really rather depressed. Uh, He felt that he couldn't go back and tell the team that Charles wasn't interested. So he thought, well, what am I going to do now to pass the time? And uh, he remembered that there was one more person on his list, uh, someone he hadn't yet seen. So he said to himself, okay, well, I'll go and knock on his door, I'll see him, and then maybe I'll have the courage to go and speak to the rest of the team. So he went and knocked on the door of the man living in the very next room to Prince Charles. The door opened, and there was a very ordinary man from a very ordinary background. He invited Nigel in. They started chatting. They chatted for about an hour. And at the end of that hour, this man was a son of the king. Now that is a very wonderful truth, isn't it? The Bible says that if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is a wonderful truth. And I want to ask you this morning, if you call yourself a Christian, how much does that particular truth mean to you? Listen to these words by Jim Packer in one of the finest Christian books I've ever read. It's a book called Knowing God. And uh, here's what Jim Packer says. He says, quote, If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he or she makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his or her father. If this is not the thought that controls their worship and prayers, indeed their whole outlook on life, it means they don't understand Christianity very well. For everything that Christ taught is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Now, are we gripped, dear friends, by that wonderful truth that God is our Father? Because if we are, it's going to have massive implications for the way that we think and feel and act. Now, as we've been working our way through Matthew chapter 6, we've discovered that there are two great themes in this chapter. The first theme is hypocrisy. Uh, We looked at it, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago in the first 18 verses. Do you remember that uh, that particular man who made sure that everybody knew when he was giving money 
to those in need. He did it noisily. Do you remember that? And uh, he made sure that everybody knew when he was praying by doing it on the corner of a busy street so everyone would see him. And he made sure that everyone knew when he was fasting by making himself look tired and hungry. Now that is hypocrisy. Uh, It's being more concerned about what other people think about us than what God might be thinking. And then the other theme, the second theme in Matthew 6 that we looked at last week, is money or materialism. So do you remember verse 19? Uh, where Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures in earth where moth and rust destroy. And Jesus was saying, wasn't he, materialism doesn't pay, money and possessions don't last, and more than that, they don't satisfy. Uh, Verse 23, if your eyes are bad and your whole body will be full of darkness, and if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's so foolish, Jesus says, to be a materialist, to live just for stuff, for things in this world. It doesn't pay, it doesn't satisfy. What is the cure? Uh, What is the cure for the hypocrisy amongst professing Christians and the materialism that so easily can take first place in our hearts? Uh, The answer is a knowledge of God as Father. We saw that, didn't we, two weeks ago? The cure for hypocrisy. That word Father comes again and again and again. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And your Father sees what is done in secret. Ten times the word Father appears in that section. And what is the cure for materialism? It's exactly the same. And so there was the appeal, wasn't there, at the end of the passage last week. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And we were challenged, weren't we, to make a choice, either for God or money. And Jesus says, you've got to make that choice because you can't do both. Now, of course, there's absolutely no doubt about the choice that Jesus wants us to make. And the section we're looking at this morning is designed to help us. Uh, Jesus is saying, as it were, live for God, not money, and let me tell you why. But another way to think about it is to see it as a choice between the world's way of living and the Father's way of living. The world's way is characterised by worry and the Father's way is characterised by trust. Now that's the choice. Which way are you going to live your life? Well, let's think first about the world's way characterised by worry. Now, next time you go to the doctor... Uh, If you ask him what is the most common complaint amongst his patients, he will tell you that it is some form of stress-related illness. Uh, Despite all of the amazing advances in modern medicine, the doctors still haven't managed to find a way to stop us worrying. Uh, Of course, there are plenty of things, aren't there, that people can worry about if they choose to do so. Uh, We can worry about our job security. We can worry about our families back home. We can worry about passing the exams. We can worry about crime. We can worry about our health. We can worry about our finances. And yet, isn't it interesting that knowing all of that, Jesus says quite emphatically, do not worry. And you'll notice that he says it three times. He says it once in verse 25. He says it again in verse 31. And he says it a third time in verse 34. My dear friends, you and I need to get hold of the fact that this is not a suggestion. This is not a tip from heaven for healthy living. 
It is a command from Jesus the King. And let's be clear uh, about this. Let's be clear that Jesus is not saying, uh, there, there, don't worry because everything's going to be all right. Because Jesus never, never, never promises the Christian a trouble-free life. We are living in a Christ-rejecting world and because the world is hostile to Christ, it is frequently hostile to his people too. Now Jesus warns about that all over the Gospels. Uh, So there's a place where Jesus says to the disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. And indeed, at the very end of our passage this morning, have a look at it, Jesus says, each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus does not promise the Christian a trouble-free life. But what Jesus is saying in this passage is if you call yourself my disciple, you must not give way to worry. Now the question is, what sort of worry is Jesus talking about? Uh, Is all worry uh, off limits? What about the employer whose business is going through a rough patch, uh, who's worried about the welfare of his staff? If he's got to retrench lots of people, are they going to find another job in this economic climate? Is that a wrong thing to worry about? Or what about the man who's away from his family, down here studying at the college, worried about his wife and children. Are they going to have enough food this week? Is that kind of worry off limits? Well, the word translated worry in our Bibles has a very, very specific meaning in the New Testament. In uh, most of the context where I could find it, it carries the idea of forgetting... God's immediate and powerful presence. Let me say that again. It's it's forgetting God's immediate and powerful presence. Now, this is quite a new idea for some of us this morning, so we need a couple of examples to help us. Please won't you keep one finger in Matthew 6 and turn on a few pages to Matthew 10 on page 686. Matthew 10 page 686. I'm going to be reading from verse 17. What's happening here is Jesus is giving his disciples a briefing about what to expect in their future ministry. Matthew uh, Matthew 10, verse 17. Jesus says, Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. Now, why not? I mean, I would have thought that's a pretty frightening experience, wouldn't you, being flogged in the synagogues? Jesus explains. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So can you see in Matthew chapter 10 that the reason the disciples mustn't worry about what to say when they're asked to explain their ministry to a hostile audience is that the Holy Spirit is going to tell them what to say. In other words, God will be with them. And of course, if God is with them, well then there's nothing to worry about, is there? Now turn on, please, to Luke chapter 10 on page 733. Luke chapter 10, one of my favourite stories in the Gospels because it's so practical and down to earth. Luke chapter 10, uh, I'll read from verse 38. Luke 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. 
she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So do you have the picture? Martha is worried about the food. Um, Twelve unexpected guests have arrived. She's got to prepare the supper. And her sister is in Bible study. Now, under normal circumstances, of course, that would be extremely stressful. But these aren't normal circumstances, are they? Because one of the dinner guests is Jesus. And either Martha has forgotten who Jesus is... Or she simply doesn't realise that Almighty God, the creator of the universe, has come for dinner. Because, of course, if God has come for dinner, well, you don't have to worry, do you? Either about the food, or anything else for that matter. So can you see, friends, that the kind of worry that is forbidden to Christians is the worry that forgets the immediate and powerful presence of Jesus. Now, with that in mind, come back please to Matthew 6 and let's look again at the things Jesus tells us we're not to be worried about. Jesus has three things in view. He says in verse 25, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. So food, drink and clothing are things the Christian is not to worry about. Now that is radical. Uh, Some of you might know that in the 1940s uh, a man by the name of Abraham Maslow developed a theory which came to be known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Anybody heard of it? Um, His theory was that human beings are quite incapable of growing intellectually or relationally, unless they absolutely certain that their basic needs are going to be taken care of. That was what he thought. And yet, isn't it interesting that here we find the Lord Jesus saying exactly the opposite. Do not worry about these things. Now, once again, we've got to be clear what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying that we're to become careless about food and clothing. So, just to bring this up to date, uh, this is not a license for us to eat junk food or endless sugary drinks or turn up for work or lectures in in our pyjamas. No, we are to be good stewards of our bodies and we are to eat and drink sensibly in the light of the knowledge that we have and we are to dress in such a way that will not bring dishonour on the name of the Lord Jesus. But what Jesus is saying most emphatically is that we are not to stress about these things. Why not? Why not? Well, one of the reasons Jesus gives for why we must not worry about these things is in verse 32. I wonder if you spotted it. In verse 32, Jesus says, don't do this because the pagans run after them. In fact, the pagans are extremely anxious about them. Now, I know that that anxiety is going to look different in different cultures, and I don't want to be glib about it. And, of course, please remember that in Jesus' day, people were often worried about these things, either because they couldn't afford them, or because they quite simply weren't available. And for some of you back home, that is still the situation today, and I don't want to underestimate for one moment just how difficult that must be. But here in Cape Town, I think the focus of worry is a bit more subtle. Uh, If you're standing in the checkout queue at Woolworths, you will find row upon row of lifestyle magazines. Every single one of them, without exception, is encouraging us to be totally fixated with the three things Jesus says we're not to obsess about. Isn't that right? 
The message in these magazines seems to be <clears throat> that if we're not devoting our mental energies to eating just the right food, gourmet food of course, drinking the right drink and wearing the latest fashions, well there's got to be something wrong with you. Uh, if these things are not major priorities in our lives, we've lost the plot. That's the idea. But you see, whether we're rich or poor, Jesus says, being seriously anxious about such things as food and drink and clothing is not appropriate for those who call themselves Christians. Now, why is that? After all, for the disciples who heard Jesus speaking on the mountain, they weren't luxury items, were they? They were essentials, they were necessities of life. And yet still Jesus says, yes, I know that. I know you need these things. But don't go the world's way, characterised by worry. Here's our second point. Rather, Jesus says, go the Father's way, characterised by by trust. Because you see, worry about food, drink and clothing is incompatible with faith in God. So come with me to verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, isn't life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Now it's easy to read that and miss the assumption that's there in the text. Jesus doesn't spell it out. He, he knows we've got a brain. He expects us to fill in the gap. But I think what he's saying is pretty obvious. He's saying that if God has provided the greater thing, he will certainly provide the lesser. So if God has given us the wonderful gift of life, he will give us, surely, the food we need to sustain it. So, the argument goes, he's given us our bodies. And he'll make sure that we have sufficient clothing to protect them. It would be perverse of God not to do that. Uh, to give a silly example, it would be like somebody who spends a fortune to buy a top-of-the-range car for his wife but refuses to give her the petrol money to fill it up. I mean, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? And in the same way, Jesus is saying it is inconceivable that the Father would give us life and bodies but not food and clothing. So don't worry about these things, says Jesus. God will provide and then to underline the point, he gives two examples from nature. The first is the birds in verse 26. Now look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Now clearly Jesus is not suggesting that we stop working. Uh, he's not saying that we should simply uh, rely on God to deliver food parcels to our front door every morning. Of course, there was a time when Jesus did that, wasn't there? Do you remember? With Moses in the desert, daily manna and quail. But that's not really the point Jesus is making. After all, the birds are not lazy, are they? Um, I look around the birds in my garden in the morning. They work extremely hard to get their food. Actually, they do less than human beings. And yet still the Father ensures that they have enough to eat. And therefore, Jesus says, we can trust the Father to provide for us as well. Someone wrote a, a rather lovely short poem based on these verses. I think Alice posted it on one of the social media sites this week. It goes like this. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. It's, uh, it's good, very well put. It's not quite what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus in verse 26 does not say their heavenly father feeds them. He says your Heavenly Father feeds them. And that's an important distinction because you see to the birds, God is simply the creator. 
But you see, to those who trust in Christ, he's the Father. And the point is, you see, that if God the Creator feeds the birds, then surely God the Father will feed us his children. After all, says Jesus at the end of verse 26, are we not much more valuable than they? And Jesus adds in verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? In other words, worry doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't achieve anything. And that leads to Jesus' second illustration in verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes, he says? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labour or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. So, in August, I think it is, you drive up the N7, west of Cape Town, to go and see the flowers. Some of you have done it. And they are quite stunning, aren't they? Um, You didn't put them there. God put them there. And uh, the beautiful colours actually make even the finest clothes of the wealthiest people look really rather dreary by comparison. So, verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? You see, to worry about those things is a vote of no confidence in God. The God who's revealed himself to all his people as our loving Heavenly Father. He feeds the birds. He clothes the flowers of the field. How much more will he provide for his children? Now, in our context, that makes us feel just a little uncomfortable. I want you please to remember that when these words were first spoken, They were spoken in first century Palestine. There was widespread and frequent poverty. Most people lived hand to mouth. So when they said, what shall we eat? Uh, They weren't worrying, were they, about how to choose between the vast variety of food on the shelves in the supermarket. No, they were saying, where on earth is the next meal coming from? And when they said, what shall we wear? They weren't concerned with image or fashion. They were concerned about being warm enough at night in the middle of winter in uh, the Middle East and frosts. And yet even in that extreme situation, Jesus commanded them, do not worry. Now I know that at first glance that sounds a bit harsh and yet there's nothing cruel here about what Jesus is saying because what Jesus is saying to all of us is do you trust me? If you do, don't worry. God, your loving Father, will provide. And I think at this point I need to say two things to prevent any misunderstanding. For a start, Jesus is not saying that the Father will provide us with everything that we want. The promise here is for the bare necessities of life. Now, praise God, he does sometimes give us more than we need. But he hasn't promised to do that. And we can't go around accusing God of unfaithfulness because we don't get that promotion at work or we don't get the husband or wife that we want or we don't get that house that we've been praying for we are not promised all that we want that's one potential misunderstanding that we need to avoid here's the second this passage does not absolve us from our responsibility to provide food and clothing for those in need If we're in a position to help, and not everybody is, but if we are in a position to help, God expects us to do it. 
Yes, God has promised to provide the necessities of life for all his children, for those who trust in Christ. But we need to remember that God's normal way of providing these necessities is through the sacrificial giving of Christian people. So, uh, the book of Acts makes it very clear that in the first century, the members of the church shared their possessions so that there was no one amongst them who was in need. And uh, when Christians in Judea were suffering during a terrible famine, the Apostle Paul arranged for Gentile Christians in other parts of the Mediterranean to meet their needs. Now friends, that is the standard for us. That is the example that we are to follow in our fellowship here in this church. In one of his letters, the Apostle Paul says that we are to do good to all people and especially to those who belong to the household of faith. So we have a particular responsibility as Christian people to provide for Christians living in poverty. Now actually, that's true, but it's not exactly the point that Jesus is making here. He doesn't address the question in this passage of how God will meet the needs of his people. He just says that he will, because he's your father. And he loves you. And he knows what you need. He will provide. And that's why Jesus can say the words of verse 31. Do not worry. Now my dear friends, surely if Jesus could give that command in first century Palestine, in a subsistence economy, where starvation was a constant threat... How much more does that command apply to you and me? The key, I think, is verse 32, where Jesus says, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So remember that you have a loving heavenly Father who knows that you need food and drink and clothing so don't worry about those things and because that's true we Christians have a much higher God given priority it's there in verse 33 can we all see verse 33 very important verse seek first his kingdom says Jesus and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Now notice the standard New Testament pattern there because there is a command seek first his kingdom and there's a promise all these things food, drink, clothing will be given to you as well. Now I think therefore the key question is this What does it mean to seek first God's kingdom? Well, I don't think I can say it any better than John Stott, so please turn over to the reverse of the pink question sheet. And uh, as we close, let me read for you what the Bible says. And I'm going to leave you to think about the applications in your Bible study group this week. Can we all see it? John Stott says, God's kingdom is Jesus Christ ruling over his people in total blessing and total demand. To seek first this kingdom is to desire, as of first importance, the spread of the reign of Jesus Christ. Such a desire will start with ourselves until every single department of our life home, marriage, family, personal morality, professional life and business ethics, bank balance, tax returns, lifestyle, citizenship, all of that 
is joyfully and freely submissive to Christ. It will continue in our immediate environment with the acceptance of evangelistic responsibility towards our relatives, colleagues, neighbours and friends. And it will also reach out in global concern for the missionary witness of the church. Now you see, Jesus is saying that if God's kingdom is my top priority today, then I can trust Almighty God to provide the necessities of life tomorrow, the day after that, and all the days to come. That is a promise from our Heavenly Father to all of his children. Do you believe it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the amazing privilege we have to address the creator and sustainer of the universe as our Father who loves us and knows all our individual needs perfectly. Father, help us to trust you to provide all that we need, whatever our circumstances might be. And as we learn to trust you more and more, help us, Father, to put the priorities of the kingdom first surrendering our own lives to the gracious rule of King Jesus and actively seeking opportunities to share the good news of the kingdom with others. For it is in his name we ask it. Amen.